Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Student Media Podcast. I'm Evan Couch. As you can see, Deacon is not with us today. He is busy getting stuff ready for the launch of Pulse Magazine coming out in a couple weeks. But very special <laughs> guest, Jennifer Green. She is the academic advisor for pretty much everything we do in student media, you know, like with Pulse, I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> with Pulse, with Pulse and you know, the other important one, Observer, CNW is also important. Terry knows that. We spoke with her. Yes. But we held true to our promise of making sure that we got all of our uh, faculty, our faculty advisor, not academic yes. advisor. My apologies. I, I noticed you spoke with Terry first. Well, I, you know, <laughs> Terry, it was just, uh, Terry was Terry was a big name. Everyone everyone knows Terry in the, uh, yes. in the student media world. Yes, and she does. People have either like a, a deep love for her or they kind of fear her a little bit. And I was like, she's, <laughs> she's a very polarizing figure that we would love I that's, I think that's a faculty advisor's job is to be feared but loved. <laughs> oh, I, don't, I don't know. I don't. I don't fear you. Do I? I do you think no, people fear I'm you? Joking. I. I know. I don't think I inspire fear in pretty much anybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just wanted to start off by asking you. You know, like so far, how do you think both of the the ones that you oversee, Pulse and Observer, how are they doing this quarter? What are your overall just thoughts and opinions so far? Like where we're at in in week. What are we in week nine, week eight, week eight? Uh, yeah, and I'm glad you're asking me this now and not week one. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, every quarter with student media, you have a whole new batch of students. And that right. can be, um, you know, that can be a real hurdle to, it's an opportunity, but it's also a hurdle to make sure that you're teaching students everything they need to know to be able to go out and do their jobs. Because they also, you know, you guys want to feel competent when you go out and interview somebody and report on a story. and some of the stories we're reporting on are sensitive topics. So we, we want to make sure we get it right, you know? Um, and so, you know, student media was originally set up to be practical or practicum courses that build on the skills you get in classes. But the reality is that a good chunk of the students that come to our student media outlets haven't taken those practicum courses, right? right? So we have to like squeeze in the training that we can. And, you know, of course it's not enough, but with, um, I think the way we have both staff set up with kind of a leadership, a level of leadership and impulse, we have fewer leaders, but, um, but at Observer, we have quite a few people like you, like you on the leadership staff mm -hmm. that can also serve as mentors and kind of answer questions that come up. And you guys have had a little bit more of the journalistic training, although I know pretty much everybody that steps into one of those roles feels like they need more training. <laughs> so, right. You know, nobody ever feels overqualified. I don't, and probably that wouldn't be a good thing if somebody came in feeling like they do everything. So, but anyway, so I feel like this quarter, because it's fall quarter and just the, the number of people that I had on both staffs that graduated in spring, um, we had really new staffs in both classes. And on Pulse, we had a pretty small, we have a big class, but we have a small team of writers. So we actually had more um, designers or almost as many designers as writers, which is fantastic for the kind of publication we put out. But um, we had new writers with no journalism experience reporting th up to three stories, um, which is a lot. Right. So, um, so I don't know if that answers your meeting but I, or your question, but I mean, I feel like both are going amazingly well. And considering what I just talked about with the staffing for fall quarter, I'm I am we're way further along in both publications than I would have hoped for, to be honest. I think we're doing amazing work. We've we lost our designer for Observer right before classes started, and mm -hmm. our new designer didn't have any experience on Observer, and she's doing amazing work. I mean, by mid quarter already, she's putting out you know newspapers that look like she's been with us for two or three quarters. So I'm super impressed with that. I think the reporting. All of the staff has been reporting really well. We've got a lot of interviews on every story in both Matt in both publication. Um, Observer's been really well copy edited as well, and we're tackling some really big stories on campus. Yeah, absolutely. Especially with the Title IX stuff and everything that's going on there. I mean, those aren't easy stories to cover in in any in any way. But I wanted to I wanted to ask you, you know, you're talking about bringing in new writers who don't have that level of experience. And say they're struggling at the beginning of the quarter and, you know, things are going either just they're just not getting the hang of things, whether it's it's AP style or just interviewing techniques, things like that. How much of what they're learning and what they're able to accomplish from the beginning of the quarter to the end of the quarter falls on 
student leaders who are running the class because it's it's a student run class and how much of it would you say is actually on the writer's ability because you know yeah. they're being taught from people like me who are just students in the class who were learning the same thing they were learning either a quarter ago or two quarters right. ago so like right. having an effective leadership staff in that class obviously is a big big thing because it helps these it yeah. helps these new students coming in to learn the proper techniques and obviously we don't know all the proper techniques we're still learning as well but how much of it falls on that leadership staff and how much of it falls on the student himself right. or herself? Well, and I would underscore that, you know, CWU's motto is live, learn, do, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that student media embodies that because you guys are learning and doing at the same time and you're living, <laughs> you're, you right. know, living the experience and you also have to live with mistakes, but that's the nature of student media. Um, and, you know, fortunately we haven't, we don't tend to make, in, in my year with, um, student media, we haven't made any errors that I, you know, feel like were, um, or I'm just, maybe I'm not remembering, but I don't think so. I don't think we've made any, you know, that students haven't made any errors that were significantly, um, you know, harmful in any way. So mm -hmm. that's really important. I mean, to answer your question, I think there's probably layers of um, leadership and mentoring that happen in student media and that comes about naturally so the people who rise up to the top editorial positions have generally been there a little longer taken more classes understand the process you know and so they can kind of be the stopgap to help when maybe the editorial staff when you guys as editors don't necessarily feel that you're in control of the students or the product or you know you're not able to answer questions um, and then I'm always there. So, you know, if people, I think you guys aren't coming to me a ton to help with, I think I'm, I'm getting a lot more questions this quarter on story ideas and, um, you know, some of the more tricky stories on reporting those. I'm um, getting fewer questions about dealing with students who are struggling. I think you guys are handling that yourselves and you're doing a good job with it. We don't want anybody to fall through the cracks. At the end of the day, you know, we're putting out a product and a publication and on both staffs, the publication is kind of the ultimate goal. It has to be, we want to keep it at our standards. I think both publications have a really high standard, which I'm very proud of for such a small program in a small rural college. I feel like we're competitive at a national level in both publications, and I'm really proud of that with, with small staffs and not a lot of resources. Um, but, uh, but, you know, at the end of the day, you guys are here to learn. So, and that counts for every single student. So we don't want, unless somebody's really just not putting in the effort and then it's kind of on their shoulders, but we don't want somebody who's trying and wants to learn and is participating to feel like they're not getting anything out of the experience. That would be, that would be a failure. You know, you kind of mentioned right there, like being in a rural school, like a rural, rural area for, uh, you know, a university like Central, definitely yeah. an odd and unique perspective to be at a school like this, but mm -hmm being competitive or at least being to the point where like getting people to read and making some good hard hitting stories. Oftentimes it seems like when you're in this area, you might not get the same kind of beats, the same kind of stories that are happening elsewhere. And, you know, obviously if you have good talented writers, it makes up for that because if it's a story that's not as hard hitting as something that you might get, if you're in UW, you know, where there's right. probably more, more news events happening. There's a lot more things happening. You're in Seattle, you're downtown. There's a lot of, either good or bad things going on all the time well yeah. here you know you don't get those same kind of stories so like how much of that falls on the writer to really just pick it up and you know make a piece that's worth reading i'm not sure i'd agree with that though because this is a college campus like any other and it's a, yeah. it's a good sized campus i mean i know enrollment is down but we've been at over ten thousand, which is considered a large school um so, you know, we're going to have the same kinds of stories on our campus as anywhere else. And you have to take into account that the people who come to study here are coming from a lot of different places. So it's not like this is a rural population, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then the town is, you know, Ellensburg's a really weird mix of people. <laughs> it's like, you know, I think it has, it has its cowboy side. It's got, you know, it's built around the <laughs> rodeo and all of that. And, you know, it is, a, it's a rural location. You can't deny that. But there's a real influx of a lot of urban folks, you know, both on campus and, and among the, profess the professors. Um, and then there's a real artist community, too, that I've seen in the decade or so that I've lived here. I've seen that grow, grow a lot, too. So I do think, feel like there's, there's always stories. There's never mm -hmm. not stories, right? So it's just a matter of finding them. And we've had some pretty hard-hitting pieces in Observer every quarter since I've been here. So 
the stories are out there. It's just a matter of keeping your ear to the ground and finding them. And, you know, sometimes that can take a little more creativity on a slow news week. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, I always tell you guys to try to localize. So, you know, you can look at the UW, what's it called, the Daily, I think, and see what they're covering and see if there's a local version of that happening. You know, if you want to look at a bigger school, um, you can read the Seattle Times and try to localize stories that they're reporting. You know, you can kind of find a local angle on any trend or current event happening. This, you know, like, and and being from your being like a faculty advisor, you always, you always bring up at the beginning of the quarter that you're there, it's a student led class, but you're there to help if needed. And especially with things right. like finding stories or maybe things like writing and things like that. Right. Deegan wanted to know he had, he, he submitted a question via text <laughs> message about 20 minutes ago. He was wondering <laughs> what is it like to, to be in that position for both classes, you know, like, and especially with the experience that you have, in writing yeah. and journalism, yeah. do you find yourself kind of biting yes. your tongue answer, sometimes yes. <laughs> and like trying to yes. just be like, oh, I wouldn't do yeah. that if I were you or? Yeah, Deacon sees me suffer. It's, um, <laughs> it's you know, I mean, I'm so proud of you guys and the work that you do. So it, it you know, it's it's really an enviable job to have, honestly. It's, it's a very fun job and it's great to kind of see students who are learning skills, get excited about them and you know, put them into practice. So it's, I, I wouldn't say it's, I'm joking when I say I suffer, I wouldn't say that it's a job where you suffer. I think it's a job that's truly enviable. It's a lot of fun, but it is hard. You have to strike that balance between letting the students lead, but also, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to let them stumble into, you know, any serious trouble. You don't want to, um, you know, you don't want to just sit by and with your arms crossed and say, okay, well, good luck to you. See you later, you know. Learn the hard so, way. Yeah, but, you know, you also have to be really careful about overstepping. And, you know, sure, there's times you, you it depends on every staff too, because there's some staffs that come in and want a lot more handholding. And there's others to, and, and individuals that do. And there's others that really don't, that just want to be left alone. They don't want the input, you know. And I'm not going to ever not give input because that's my job. <laughs> I have to, I'm paid for something, you know, right. for, for a reason. So I'm never going to not give input, but it's, you know, every quarter I, I have to kind of find that line and find, figure out what that staff of that quarter really wants from me. I don't always get it right, but I try. I mean, that's, it's like, that's all you can do, right? Just, just right. try and you kind of hope that the students are going to take, take your advice or, and if they yeah. don't, you're just like, well. I told them. I mean, well, and then we that. have this system of the choppies where I, you know, for right. observer anyway, and I do it for Pulse too, but it's after the, you know, so after the fact that it's a little different. But the weekly choppy copy for people who don't, who aren't on staff is where I edit what you guys have done. And, um, and that can be a really hard process. You know, I definitely try to be sensitive that students feel bad when they make mistakes and, and maybe they're a little embarrassed because it's in a public forum, you know. Um, but, uh, but that is an essential part of the learning process. And, you know, again, knowing that you guys are here to learn, it's not about putting out something perfect mm -hmm. every week, you know, it's about putting out better and better product every week and doing the very best job you can and learning along the way. I mean, you guys get so much out of, I think as a practicum course, I think you get so much out of both of those classes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You, you talked about, you know, getting, this is what you get paid to do now, but you used to get paid for another type of journalistic writing here. This is a segment that Deacon and I called Share Your Screen Thoughts here. So I'm going to share my screen here. Okay. You have obviously a lot of experience in journalism. And as you can see, I've done some brief research on some of the pieces you've done. That's an, old, that's an oldie but a goodie. Oldie but a goodie, yep. That was actually my first piece for The Hollywood Reporter. Um, you know we yeah, just walk us through oh, it. Just like, what, what's... On, so um, we were on sabbatical in Madrid that year. So I lived in Madrid and... I uh, worked as a journalist there for about 11 years before I came to Central. And um, we did in 2018, 2019, we did a sabbatical year back in Madrid. And while I was there, um, the Hollywood Reporter reached out to me to see if I wanted to do some reporting for them because I had previously been a correspondent for a competitor magazine in Spain. Uh, it's actually a British magazine, but it's international like the Hollywood Reporter. It's called Screen International. So they knew me and they knew my work. And Honestly, the world of film industry journalism is very small and incestuous. So everybody knows everybody. 
Mm-hmm. So anyway, they reached out to me and they wanted to, this is when Bolsonaro was just elected and they wanted to do a story on how that was going to impact the entertainment industry. So, um, I mean, I reported that from Madrid, but I also actually had Brazilian friends in Madrid that were able to kind of hook me up with other people. And then I reached out to, um, here, scroll down a little bit. This was kind of, I was fangirling. I reached out a little further down. I reached out to um, The Intercept. I don't know if you've heard of that organization. There it is. So Andrew Fishman, Rio-based managing editor of investigative news outlet, The Intercept. So that's the that's a um, a news outlet that started by Glenn Greenwald, who is a, a longtime journalist, and he's also a very well-known critic of U.S. media. Mm-hmm. And so Andrew Fishman works with him and I didn't think I would get anybody on the phone, but I emailed them through their website and he got back to me and said he would talk with me. So I was pretty excited about talking with him and that was not an entertainment angle. He was giving me more of kind of the political side. Yeah, these, the pieces for the Hollywood Reporter are a lot of fun because they are, um, they're long features. So I get to do a lot of in-depth reporting. I get to talk to a lot of people. I just published one last week actually for the Hollywood Reporter on I think it might be. No, you've got two older ones. Anyway, I published one last week on um, international film shooting in Spain. Mm-hmm. And that was another fun one, you know, and I only get a week or two to to work on these stories. So it's not like I have all the time in the world, but um, it helps that I lived and worked there for so long because I know I know most of the players or I know somebody who knows somebody, you know. Right. And it's about making uh, I, something I've learned is like journalism in general is a lot about making those connections. Yes. And and keeping those connections because through those connections you kind of you 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 develop strong relationships that you can kind of count on in yeah. terms of like a friendship but also in terms of business you know right so I I appreciate that you highlighted this story because um, the year that we were on sabbatical was the year that Netflix opened up their production offices in Madrid so I got to cover that and that was their first production hub in Europe so now they've opened up in I think Amsterdam and maybe London and somewhere in Germany so they've got production centers all over, but their first one was Madrid, which was a huge coup for the Spanish film industry to get Netflix to open there first. And so I got to go to their offices and cover um, cover the um, cover the opening of, of that and some of the premieres, like the Money Heist premiere was while I was there, the new season of Money Heist. So we got to go to that. And so that was a lot of fun to cover. And this one also, I was at the Malaga film. Oh, I was on a, uh, I was on the jury the critics jury at the Malaga film festival that year. So I got to do some interviews while I was down there too. Some Something I wanted to ask about just in general, obviously you're, you talk about being on sabbatical for both of these stories that you wrote here. Yeah. How does journalism kind of differ there than it does here? Or does it, do you not really find that big of a difference? Are you still just doing the same kind of work? You're just meeting different people. And- so that's kind of a two pronged answer because I have always worked for international or American or British media outlets while in Spain. So I, I, I didn't write. In fact, I don't think I've ever written for Spanish news outlets. I've written for Spanish organizations and like the Spanish film academies had me write some pieces here and there, but, Mm -hmm. uh, but I was working for American and British news outlets. Um, I worked for the Washington post. I worked for ABC news and ESPN doing production assistance. And then I worked also for um, screen international Hollywood reporter. So they're all, you know, U S or UK based meaning I haven't worked for Spanish media. However, I can tell you Spanish media is different. Um, And in some ways, the American system, I think, is coming closer to a European model now, which is that you know going in the sort of political leanings of your news outlet. So, you know, we have this idea of neutrality, objectivity in American media where, you know, you pick up the New York Times and you're not supposed to think, oh, this is a liberal news publication, right? Now with MSNBC and Fox, which you guys have grown up with, I mean, that's, you know, relatively new for for some of us. I think we've come closer to that model where you know and you go and you pick your news outlet based on the political stance. And that's very typical in Europe. You know, you know what you're getting when you pick up the papers. But there's they're having all the same issues with, you know, print trying to support print versus online and you know, make money online and um, you know, so all the same trends are happening everywhere. 
I know we briefly talked about those connections there, and I think I heard uh, I think I heard ESPN in there somewhere. So if you still have that connection, you know, just you know, throw <laughs> throw Evan Couch's name out there a little bit. Send yeah, some well, letters. this was this was a long time ago, but this was probably early two thousands, and they're a sister network of ABC. So mm, I was right. working, you know, through ABC when ESPN would come to town, and usually it was basically to follow like an American player around. Um, and we did a, one of the first stories I worked on was we followed the first female bullfighter of Spain around the country for two weeks. <laughs> Where can I find that article? I, I, all right. Yeah. I need, apparently I need to do better research because there are some crazy articles I can find from you on there. Well, I didn't write anything. So that was for ABC News. It was for, I think it was for, I'm trying to remember, it was for one of their news programs, their news magazine formats. And so those are longer pieces. It was probably like a 20 minute piece on, on television. When it came out and i don't actually have the final product i'm sure you could find it somewhere i i yeah. youtube i googled it once and tried to find it on youtube and i couldn't find it but yeah so christina sanchez was the first female bullfighter in spain and um we did a profile of her and followed her around and i was the only person on crew that spoke spanish for a good chunk of the time so i had to like negotiate with these like small town bullring owners and <laughs> on the back by the head <laughs> trying to get us in and it was hilarious it was a real uh it was a real like sink or swim moment in my journalistic career. <laughs> uh, no, well, like aside from just, you know, the journalistic experiences that you've, you've formed over the years in traveling and doing that kind of work, just overall, what's the best country you think you've been to like in your travels? So it, I maybe been, like a top three. There are big chunks of the world. I don't know. I've never been to Asia. I have, I've been to Australia. Um, my mom has been a lot of time. Yeah, my mom has spent a lot of time in India, and I've never been. I'd love to go there. I've been to Latin America, but I haven't been to South America, so I've been to Central and Central America and Mexico. I mean, I have a soft spot for Spain because I lived there for so long. My kids were mm -hmm. both born there. You know, it's my second home, and I feel I feel part Spanish at this point. So, um, so I'd say Spain, and I highly your, recommend it. <laughs> your kids have dual citizenship. They got they're they they're in yeah, Spain. They uh, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, it's really nice because with the Spanish passport, they could live and work anywhere in Europe. There you go. Tell them, tell them to go over there. Just get out of here. Go, go, go make right. life there. It seems so great over there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so back uh, to but the I more... still, you know, Well, I was just going to say, I still write quite a lot. I mean, I do, I write for Common Sense Media, which is a, um, it's a website that does film reviews and they're kind of targeted for families. So you can, they, we, we do kind of a review section, but then we also break it down by like aspects of the film that parents might be concerned about. And I started writing for them um, in 2019 um, when my kids were a little bit younger and I used their site a lot. So I was really excited to write for them. And so I still review 10 to 12 films a month for them, mostly mostly streaming, re streaming releases. Do you ever so, just tear into these films like you watch it and yes. you're just like that is terrible <laughs> yes. you know, i cannot wait to get my fingers on the keyboard and rip this one to shreds well, no because you kind of feel bad you know how i mean i know how much work goes into every movie even if it's a bad one so you know you try to try to find something good if you can but you know there's usually if it's if it's just not good you know why and so you highlight that and i don't know sometimes i think i think filmmakers and I think they know that they're putting out a bad product on and it's almost like, all right, at this point, we're going to make sure that they know this is bad because yeah. if they're going to watch this, we're getting their money either way. Who cares? I tend to write about international cinema, European and Latin American, which is what I know and like the best. And so, mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I'm, I'm probably gentler than, yeah. than, you know, than I might be on a Hollywood film. Um, you know, it's more of a struggle to make a film in a lot of places than it is in the U S yeah, I so, that I mean, that makes sense too. Yeah. Whenever and I've been you're writing for the Seattle Times and the San Francisco Chronicle as well, columns for them. Yeah, them, yeah. I mean, a lot of you're, fun. You're getting out there everywhere, mm -hmm. but like when you're when you're watching a film with your kids or anything like that, and you know, are you are you like kind of breaking it down out loud to them, or are they just like, mom, <laughs> just stop, like save it yeah, for later? Right. Shut up, leave me alone. <laughs> well, my daughter's really into filmmaking, actually. She oh she, sweet. She got an iPad when she was too young to have an iPad, probably like nine, you know, and it was one that I was using for work. And then one day she picked it up and she just kind of took it over. And um, and so she got iMovie on there and she's been literally since she was eight or nine years old, she's been making movies and editing them and adding in the, the intertitles and the music. And so she's actually really talented, honestly. 
So she breaks them down. She's kind of asks me, oh, how did they do that? And, you know, she's really interested in the process. I don't make movies myself. So, you know, I can, I, I'm a reviewer, so I can, I know what goes into them. I, and, but I write about, um, and having covered the industry, I, you know, I've been on a lot of film sets and I, you know, yeah. have talked to a lot of people who are behind the scenes making the movies, but I don't make movies myself. So, um, so I'm always looking at it from the perspective of the final product, you know, kind of a consumer's perspective. Yeah. But if I'm writing about a movie, I take a lot of notes. So that is one thing. If I'm watching a movie with my kids that I have to review, I'm there with my notepad, you know, taking a lot of notes on it. I never, I don't trust my memory. <laughs> it sounds, it sounds like, you know, this perspective that you have on this, it's that age old thing where it's like, if you love what you do, you know, you never work a day in your life. And just how do you, cause you know, you have that experience, you've got to travel, you get to write pieces on, on films. And that's obviously that seems like a passion of yours. You correct right. me if I'm wrong, but film and stuff like that and, yes. and getting to write for that. Just how do you get to balance that and blend that so effortlessly, it seems like, when it comes to your writing style? Like, you just get to do this, you know? Like, does right. it does it feel like it's work whenever you're whenever you're doing stuff I mean, like that? Depends on the movie. <laughs> 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 but, I mean, I, you know, I, you're right. I, and I appreciate you saying that. It's I really love writing, number one. And writing about movies is, you know, could not be more fun. So I, you know, I, yes, it, it feels like work in the sense that there's other things I might be doing if I wasn't sitting and watching an, a movie and writing about it, but um, I absolutely love doing it. And I love working with you guys on student media. So I have the best of both worlds, to be honest. Hey, well, you know what, that, that puts a soft, that's puts a soft spot in all of our hearts as student media, just for that alone, <laughs> knowing, knowing that we are appreciated and that there are people who have our backs and things like this and oh, totally. i mean you're yeah. getting to see you're getting to see firsthand you get to see my writing which is you know it's my writing it's whatever but then you also get to see you get to see the kind of stuff that like deacon and i do as the two dumb guys right. behind the microphone right. just get to have yeah. fun having conversations with people i mean the truth is you can't necessarily plan like if you had asked me when i was your age if this is what i wanted to do i probably would have said yes um but I wouldn't have known how I was going to get here, you right. know? And so you kind of have to let things unfold and take chances where you can get them. And I, I also think it's really important to just keep doing the things that you love, like you guys are doing with the podcast, you know, kind of make those opportunities for yourself, even if it's unpaid, even if it's, you know, on top of a full-time job, like just make those opportunities for yourself because they eventually turn into something, you know? Right. And if it's what you enjoy, then you, you know, you just keep, keep working at it until it turns into your work. I mean, that's the goal. That's the goal for everybody, right? Yeah. You know, just yeah. do the thing, do the thing you love to do. That's why we go to school. That's why we spend so much money and so much time doing what we're doing whenever we're here. Right. It's like, you got to know what your focus is and you got to know what your, what your heart wants to do. And you kind of shift focus to that and start putting in the time and the effort. And obviously someone who's had all the experiences like you can right. probably attest to that a little bit more than I can, but. Well, and there's big element of luck involved like yeah, you know I, think so I, too. I moved to Spain because I met a guy and moved there with him and I kind of fell into I had I didn't study journalism I I discovered journalism because I love to write and there was a little bilingual newspaper in the mission district where I was living in San Francisco when I was doing my master's degree and the English wasn't very good so I called them and said hey do you want me to do the translations for you because I was learning Spanish and they were like yes please <laughs> and um and that's where I got my start in journalism. Like I, the, he had me, he was a one man operation. He was running it out of the converted broom closet of the Hispanic Better Business Bureau of San Francisco. Wow. His name was Marvin Ramirez. So he sent me out to do film reviews, restaurant reviews, news story, feature stories. And I wasn't paid. It was totally just for fun on top of my master's program, but I enjoyed it. That's where I met my husband mm -hmm. in my closet. And, um, uh, <laughs> And that's how I discovered journalists. So when we moved to Spain, I just sent a letter, which I found out later nobody does, but I sent a letter to all of the correspondents I could find and track down and said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm living in Spain. Can you give me some work? And that's how I got the jobs I got. I mean, it was kind of all just good luck being in the right place at the right time, having a little bit of, you know, a little bit of skills and <laughs> pretending until I knew what I was doing. <laughs> See, well, I mean, there's still a little bit of work. There's still a little work ethic involved in there. You yes. know, if oh, you're no. driven, you're driven to go out of your way to try to find these things. If you weren't, if you weren't willing to do the kind of work and, and put in the effort, right. you know, it wouldn't, it's a different story. 
no, you definitely have to work hard if you want to have what you want to have. You know what I mean? I, yeah. you know, I, but like you said, I like my work, so it doesn't feel like hard work. It feels like work, but I enjoy it. So it's, it's what I want to do. Um, but yeah, I think there's that element of luck, an element of work, an element of being in the right place at the right time. And then once the opportunity opens, you just work as hard as you can to make it function. And, you know, my students always say they have imposter syndrome, but like everybody has that, you know, <laughs> you're never, you know, it's, it, you're never going to start something new and feel like, you know, exactly what you're doing. Mm -hmm. So it's shifting, shifting focus back to, you know, as we wrap this up with student media, the two of the oversee observer and pulse, what do you hope for the future? Like maybe just one or two things that maybe chain you want not to change, but maybe evolve as, as the rest of the year continues and maybe even the next year as, as new students come in to both of these yeah. platforms? Well, I mean, ever since I started Observer, I have really wanted the um, design to become a little less newspapery and a little more alt-weekly because we do, we are a campus publication. We come out once a week as opposed to daily, you know? So I feel like there might be, um, more creative ways to, and I, I'm not putting this on the designers because the designers come into a system that's already in place. This is something we would yeah. have to plan and put into place and then start the quarter, you know, like over the summer or over winter break or whatever. And I would have to have people on staff that really want to lead that and do it, you know? Um, but that that could be a goal for long-term. I'm not unhappy with the way the newspaper looks. I think it, I think it reads well. I think it looks good. I think people pick it up, which is your goal, you know? <laughs> Um, I think I also hope that we continue to get funding through the SNA because um, I'm finding that the system we've had in place traditionally for paid positions is not enough anymore. I feel like we need even more hours on top of credits for the amount of work that we ask of students. And you know, there's a lot of campus newspapers where people do this amount of work just for the credits, you know, I mean, there at yeah. least there's some paid hours. And I think that's a, a, a plus. I'm not trying to talk anybody out of doing the work. But I, you know, I know that we're competing for with other jobs that are available to students who might need more hours and more extra income. And so that's hard. And that's hard, especially on Pulse. We don't have much of a budget there. Um, for Pulse, um, I'm very happy with the way the magazine looks. We switched a couple of years ago to the larger format. I think it looks great. It's It allowed us to spread out our designs and our photography. Um, it's a very creative and collaborative staff. So people work together from the very beginning, You know, all of our, our visual staff and our writing staff. Um, so I don't know that I have any specific goals. I think the, the funding of the magazine and you know potentially taking on some harder hitting stories. You know, we do a lot of profiles, a lot of features, a lot of lifestyle stuff. We don't, we haven't in a while taken on kind of a really hard hitting piece. And, you know, I have to have people who want to do that um, and who have the experience to do that, but we have the time, you know, with the magazine, we have a few weeks to do the reporting as opposed to one week. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, it does like, I, I I do think that the observer could shift into a more, it like you said, it's not really on the designers either because it's a system in place already. But oh, it's like oh. just creatively, you know, there's so many. It's like you don't have to just focus on it looking like a newspaper all the time. I feel like, you know, I feel like there it's student media. We can have some fun with it, you know, like right. you can shift you can it up whatever you want. <laughs> exactly, and it's like, it's like I said, you might be in the back there biting your tongue at then in the class, like I wouldn't do that, but it. You know, good media. <laughs> but, Go ahead. You know, Go ahead. Right, but it also has to be um, has to be something that you guys want to do, and that there's that you that people stick around long enough to learn enough to want to make those changes and be able to put them into effect. You know, yeah. and that's that's the constant struggle. I'm sure Terry said the same as the the turnover. Yep. You know, so just when you guys are like really getting okay. the hang of things, you graduate. <laughs> Yep. <laughs> or you have to take another student media outlet, so you leave Observer. So that's why, you know, I'm always sort of begging people to stick with, you know, <laughs> you've got to do all three, and it's a really good experience to do all three. But once you know which one you like the best, sticking with it really not only helps you grow in that experience, but I think really helps the, the publications grow. So like my editor at Pulse right now has been with us seven quarters, and he's going to stay till the end of the year if all goes according to plan. So 
that'll be nine quarters of pulse, which is fantastic. You know, he knows it in and out. Yeah. And, you know, we'll see. We'll see what the future holds for me. I know I'll be doing this podcast. <laughs> I'm but... not only talking about you. <laughs> no, I know. I know. There's, you know, other students are just, other students need to get in those credits as well. But um, well, at the end of the day, you got to do what's right for you. And I understand right. that. So no hard feelings. <laughs> well, what we, what we have to do today, what's right for us is we, we do have to go to class uh, at Observer where we are going to look at back at our last issue that we did. That was uh, issue seven. Mm -hmm. So Jen, I cannot thank you enough for joining just me. Unfortunately, Deacon could not be here. Um, he submitted his questions though. So I appreciate that. Right. He, he had right. some hard hitting questions. Nice. Um, I'll be sure I'll definitely have Sydney throw in the links to our YouTube video of the articles that you mentioned, and maybe we can find that video that you were talking about of the, of the bull rider or the yeah. bullfighter. Um, yeah. but yeah, find it, let me know. <laughs> I will, I will, I'm going, this is part of the research I talked about. I'm yeah. going to find that video. The other, the other story, one of the first ones I did with ABC that was a long one was the opening of the Guggenheim and Bill Bow. Mm -hmm. So that was my very first story that I worked on with them. And I was bottom of the barrel, you know, just <laughs> following people around basically. I was like the third production assistant or something, but, um, but that'd be a fun one too, if you can find it. Yeah, absolutely. I will try. Okay. Jen, cannot thank you enough. I appreciate so, all the work that you do in student media and, and how much you help students. And, you know, likewise. we're going to keep, we're going to keep on <laughs> chugging along and we're going to get this quarter done and, you know, see what the future holds as well. Excellent. All right. All right. Thanks, Jen. Bye. Bye.